pleasure to welcome all of you to the SENSAP keynote. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Kameen Whitehouse, who's uh, with the University of Virginia in the Computer Science Department. So Kameen has been doing a lot of work on sensor networks. If you work, if you work in this area, I'm pretty sure you've read some of his research. He particularly focuses on uh, intelligent building, uh, and that's what his talk is going to be about. So I'll skip the detailed bio. You can find it uh, in the program, and I'll hand it over. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me to talk. I, I know many people here are deploying sensor networks in uh, very challenging environments, and so I'm here to talk to you about one of the environments that I found to be most challenging for us, uh, deploying sensors in homes. Um, so before I start, I want to just tell you why we're sens sensing homes and what we're doing there. So we find homes to be... Is there a special trick to... Advancing this. Yeah. That's what advancing is. We try to It's facing here? Or yeah, I'm like that. Sorry, sorry about that. No problem. So, so um, back to talking about why we're sensing at homes. Um, like most of you, we all spend a lot of time in our houses, and houses actually uh, are the place where we do a lot of the really interesting things in our lives. We tend to, tend to eat there, we have uh, guests there, we do our chores and our laundry, a lot of us work in our homes, we have family in our homes, and in fact, in the U.S. at least, the average person spends about 60% of their time in their own home. Huge amount of their own time. And they spend about 39% of the energy that they consume, on average, in their homes. And of all of our, uh, all of our income, not including things like mortgage and taxes and things like that that are not discretionary, but of our discretionary income, we spend about 57%, almost 60% of our discretionary income on things that we bring into and consume in the home. And so a huge fraction of our lives are being, uh, are taking place inside the home. And if we want to understand more about ourselves, it's a good place to issue. And that's already starting to happen. You probably have seen on the internet or on the, in the news um, various connected home technologies. And the connected home technologies help us connect to and potentially control um, some of these aspects of our lives. And, and so just as a couple of examples, um, the Schlage wireless door lock, for example, helps you remotely log in, check your door lock, open it or close it, give people passcodes, um, helps keep your home safe. Um, the, Hue, the built Hue wireless light bulb lets you change the color of the light, but also lets you turn the lights off remotely. So it hopefully help you save some of that 39% of your energy. And my personal favorite is the, the Belkin wireless crock pot. Um, it lets you turn off, check, you know, check the status of your dinner um, from your office, turn it off when it's done cooking. Um, and hopefully, in that way, it lets you save time by not having to run home from the lab and, and turn off the food when it's done good. And so, you know, this is what we call the connected home. It lets you connect to your home, it lets the devices uh, sometimes connect to each other, and we can start to understand what the things are in the house. But the connected home is mostly focused on its things, and it's not about letting us sense what I think are the most interesting things in the home to people. We don't want to necessarily know if my door locked or unlocked. I want to understand who left the door wide open. And my house should be able to answer me. Your wife left through that door an hour ago. Nobody has entered the house since then. Okay, so now I know who left the door open. And I don't necessarily want to know if my light on or off or what color it is. I want to know who left the lights on. You take very long showers and your daughter leaves the lights on even after leaving the room. So it gives me explanations of why, my house people give me explanations of why my energy bill is so high. And I might also want to know things not like, is my dinner done cooking, but rather, are we cooking often enough throughout the course of the month? Do we eat dinner together? And other questions about people in the house. 
And I started getting interested in occupancy sensing when I realized that there was no such thing as a good occupancy sensor. You see them in almost every room in our commercial buildings, uh, but they don't really work, right? The lights shut off when you're in the room. Um, they don't necessarily turn on. Your heating and cooling doesn't quite work. And one of the main reasons is because we don't have any good occupancy sensors. And so um, for the past two years, past five or so years, my lab has been developing a number of different technologies to do exactly that, to sense people in the homes. And one of the reasons why it's challenging in the first place is because humans are biological, we're organic, fleshy beings, and it's very hard to instrument those or interface those with electronic devices in the cyber world. Um, furthermore, people don't, especially when they're in their homes, they don't really like to be monitored on camera or with microphones. And so it becomes very difficult to monitor people, especially in their homes. Um, so we've been working on a couple of technologies, one of which um, we call the door jam sensor. Um, it is that little piece of plastic that sort of snaps in at the top of the doorway, and it has a number of sensors in it. One of them is a motion sensor, um, one, one facing in each direction, so we can see the state of the room in terms of occupancy. Uh, there's a door latch sensor to tell you if the door is open or closed. There are some sensors built into this enclosure, like a temperature sensor, a magnetometer sensor, a light sensor, and I'll tell you what I can tell you what those are for at another time. But the most interesting one on this particular device is what we call the ultrasound sensor. That uh, basically is an ultrasonic rangefinder that measures the distance to the to the ground from the top of the doorway. And when a person walks through, it measures the distance to the top of the head hopefully telling you who that person is. So in the next slide, at the bottom you'll see a little blue line that indicates that this person who's walking through is about five foot six. And that's not a unique identifier like a fingerprint, but in a home it's often enough to distinguish from other people, like her husband who's about six foot two. And there are a lot of reasons why in a home where you typically have two or three or four or five people, um, People will have different heights because of gender biases, age biases, and other reasons. And so, based on our analysis of thousands of homes where two people live in the home, this kind of technology will be able to distinguish those people in about 98% of those homes with about 98% accuracy. So only in 2% of homes does that accuracy have to drop because the heights are so similar. And once you know this information, so you know who just walked through the doorway, and, and you also know which direction the person walked, we can start to track people through the house. And if you're tracking people through a house and you're also monitoring the power meter and the water meter, which you see at the bottom here as a blue and a red line, then you can start to see things like um, the fact that whenever this person's in this room, we often see something that looks kind of like a toilet, maybe something else that looks kind of like a sink on the water mains. And so we start to guess that, well, this room probably has a toilet and a sink in it. And whenever the person walks into a different room, maybe on the electrical mains, we see that this room has something that looks kind of like a television and kind of like a 100 watt light bulb. And so this room probably has a television and a light bulb. And then and we call this a fixture finding solution. And we can do that for every room and figure out what appliances and fixtures happen to be in those rooms. And then, based on that information, we can also figure out a map of the house. So anything that has a toilet or a shower in it, probably a bathroom. Uh, anything that has a television and a light bulb might be a living room if you sit there during the middle of the day. Um, kitchen has an oven, and rooms that you might stay in for long periods of time at night are bedrooms, and rooms where you stay for short periods of time, never for long periods, those might be hallways, and so on. And so we can really build a map of the house and the appliances and the ways that the different rooms are built just by installing these sensors in the door. And once you do that, you can start to monitor not just who's walking through the door, but rather who's in the home, where they are, and then what they're doing in terms of electrical and water fixtures. If somebody just walks in, turns on the light, turns on a water fixture, we know who it is opening the fridge, we know who it is uh, using the oven. And so we can start to do things like activity recognition or elderly monitoring or energy apportionment, which means assigning energy usage to an individual person. And so these are the kinds of things that we're trying to do, and we've kind of come up with a couple of different solutions to solve these problems. The key, of course, is that we're doing it in a way that's not intrusive, so the person doesn't need to participate, they don't need to wear anything, there's no cameras or microphones, it's all entirely passive sensing. And this, sense, this system in particular, um, we're able to do this with only three kinds of sensors. The smart doorway sensor, an electrical main sensor, and a water main sensor. And we're assuming, at least for now, that those sensors at the bottom, they're already deployed. Our utility companies are, are deploying these um, you know, all, over the, all over the world as we speak. And so we hope that those will already be present. We just need to install the doorway sensors. And those doorway sensors, 
Yeah, it depends on the number, number of doors in the house, but you might have 10 to 13 of those. You'll have one water main sensor and one electrical main sensor. And so in total, we'll have something like uh, 15 sensors in a house. But to get to that system is a very different process, right? Part of what we're talking about is the system itself, but part of what we're talking about is the scientific process of designing it, testing it, and evaluating it. And so to get to the process where we knew that this doorway sensor could do all this, we had to deploy a lot of other sensors all over the house, on above the doors, next to the windows, next to the furniture, um, in various places to figure out, a little bit hard to see what those are, but there's some temp temperature sensors, humidity sensors, and so on, uh, motion sensors that we deployed all over the house. And we deployed them at about 190 of those sensors just to figure out that we only need 15, because you don't know which sensors you need in advance. And then to evaluate the system, we need to know, well, did person A actually turn on the sink, or was it really somebody else? Um, did the oven really get used at this time, or, or was that some noise on the electrical means? And so to get ground truth to evaluate this, we need to deploy a large number of other sensors, like contact re-switches on the appliances and the lights, um, um, uh, smart wireless light switches, so we can tell whether the light switches were turned on and off, and so on. And so, just for evaluation purposes, we have to deploy another 100 sensors. So yes, the system itself looks like it only takes about 10, 15 sensors, but the science behind it requires several hundred. And these sensors all go into one house, and, uh, and then we have to deploy this on multiple houses because every house is different, every household is different, and if it works in one house, you don't know if it's gonna work in another. So we end up needing to deploy this in multiple houses, and in the end, after doing many different studies, we deploy something in the order of 2,000 devices, more than 2,000 devices in more than 60 homes, and sometimes for a year or more at a time. So a lot of sensing, and uh, a lot of challenges to do that. And we thought, that many of you probably um, have deployed sensor networks outdoors as we have as well. And we thought that, well, outdoor deployments are very difficult. And this is a, here's a picture that I love um, from Jean Boitel um, showing how difficult it is to deploy outdoors wireless sensor networks. Uh, they're remote environments, they're harsh environments, there are wild animals that come and eat your sensors or steal your batteries. And we thought, well, deploying in homes is going to be much easier, right? You can sit on your couch, you can plug this thing into the wall, it's wireless, Wi-Fi, fantastic. Um, and what we found is, yes, that's true when you're deploying one sensor. Uh, but it's not true when you start scaling up. And so what we found is that in homes, there is what we call a, a um, transition region, where um, as you start scaling up, it becomes much more difficult. And so if you look at the number of sensors, for example, versus difficulty, the deployments get much more difficult as the number of sensors grows. And in particular, uh, for example, it, it, it gets much more difficult around 30 to 40 sensors because a typical home only has 30 to 40 outlets. So as the number of sensors grows larger than the number of outlets you have, it becomes much more difficult. Um, as the number of homes that you're deploying grows larger than the number of researchers, then it becomes much more important because you no longer have direct access to those homes. And as the number of days that you're deploying over grows more than about a month, you start to get fatigue in the people who are managing those sensor networks, and it starts to become much more difficult as well. And so I'm going to talk about, we, we described a lot of these in detail in our Hitchhiker's Guide back in Census 2011. You're welcome to read that. I'll go over some of these um, in, in particular, but I want to not stop there. I want to talk about some of the challenges that um, we found in deploying in homes, some of the solutions that we created since we found those challenges, and then also some of, the open, some of the open challenges that remain to be solved. So let me start by talking about the challenges. So what was so difficult about deploying in homes? Um, well, first, let's talk about what happens when you scale the number of sensors. Um, we thought that one of the main advantages of deploying in homes is that you have power. Right? You have AC power, and this makes just make all of our battery um, energy conservation problems go away. Uh, it turned out that that's not really true. Uh, houses only have about 30 to 40 outlets per home. In some of our houses, we were deploying over 300 nodes at a time. And so almost all of those nodes did not have power. Right? They still needed to be battery powered. We 
did not have power in many of the places where the sensors needed to go. So above doorways, for example. Nobody has a power receptacle above the doorway or next to a window or in other places where you want to put the sensors. And so either we end up running on batteries or we end up running long wires. And those long wires can, can cause problems on their own. One house, we had um, over 250 feet of wire to power only 13 sensors. Uh, and then we also found that the battery the battery powered sensors failed less often than the plug-in sensors. And why was that? Well, we had, um, even when we had uh, uh, power expansion packs, so you know, expanding the number of power receptacles from 30 to about over 100, um, we were consuming almost all of them. And we found that people would unplug our sensors in order to plug in their hair dryer or their vacuum cleaner. Or they would just knock them over, so we had to make sure that our our sensors uh, were not snagged, the wires were not snagged or pulled out. And so, and, and there were also uh, power outages. Um, we think of power outages as short interrupt, interrupts, but when you're talking about data sets and you look at the data set and you realize how much data has actually been lost due to power outages, it turns out to be much more than we had expected. And so we ended up losing more data from the plug-in sensors than we did from the battery power sensors. And furthermore, those plug-in sensors actually required more maintenance calls. Because when one sensor in your battery system dies, then you can go in and change all the batteries, right? They're very correlated, and you prevent any future battery failures. But with plug-in sensors, when one gets pulled out, you go pay a visit to the house, plug it back in, and the next day another one can get plugged out. There's nobody to prevent it. So we also found that, um, unlike what we saw, that where Wi-Fi, for example, covers the entire house, uh, wireless connectivity or any connectivity in general wasn't that easy in homes. So laptops and cell phones, they work just fine in houses. Um, but our sensors were often deployed in unusual places, like inside metal ducts, or inside metal junction boxes, or on plaster and concrete walls, and masonry walls. And these things are all um, big attenuators of wireless signals. In some cases, we had hundreds of nodes in our home, uh, but some nodes still only had one to two wireless neighbors. So despite the fact that you have a physically dense deployment, you might not have a dense connectivity graph. And so the next thing we would try to do is uh, what we call power line communication. Maybe some of you have used this. You can buy these modems at any uh, office supply store and run pretty high data rates across your power lines. Uh, but this only works for, for sensors that you can actually plug in. right? And as I mentioned, most of your sensors won't be plugged in. And second, those devices, those modems, are actually um, on the order of $100, so much more expensive than the sensors we were deploying themselves. And if we wanted to go for the low, low power, um, uh, less expensive power line communication modems, then those end up giving you something like 180 bits per second, and a polling rate of about once every five minutes for all the nodes in the home. And so very low data rate, um, we're, not gonna be able to, we're not able to get the data that we need off these sensors. So connectivity at home wasn't as easy as we expected. And we, other, we also thought, well, indoors, there's a, it, one big advantage is that there's a huge industry that's been going on for decades that sells devices and sensors that work in the home, unlike many of the outdoor sensor networks that, that we all are deploying. And this could be a huge advantage, but it turned out that for every different sensing need, you need to get a different system, and you need to buy a different product. And so for each product, you end up with a different communication path and data path. You end up with new bridges, um, new routers, and new software stacks. And each one of the systems that you buy and deploy turns out to have its own independent risks and failure modes. And so deploying you know, 12 different products in your home is like, is like managing 12 different sensor networks at the same time, because they all fail independently. And we actually found it easier to forego the convenience of buying off-the-shelf products and just design our own system from scratch, find a platform that we like, attach the sensors that we want to it, and deploy that everywhere so that we have much more manageable failure modes. The managing the system turned out to be much harder, in fact, than building it in the first place. So what happens is we scale up the number of homes. As we get to a larger number of homes, um, we find that they become remote environments, just in the same way that deploying on a mountaintop um, is a remote environment. Um, the, the main reason is that people, you know, your participants, if they're not actually um, the scientists doing the work, they have to make a personal commitment to let you do this work. 
And so even a, even a two second deployment, uh, two second fix requires an appointment. Right? You need to make, schedule something out. And that takes time, as delays. Um, as you start to make a, a longer deployment, let's say it gets up to about four hours, you start to interfere with people's daily routines, their meals, right? They don't want to necessarily cook and eat while you're in their house. Um, and it's very rare to have a full day to do a deployment. You'll usually only have a few hours. And so, unlike uh, a mountaintop where it's very hard to get there, but once you're there, you can stay as long as you need. And in these kinds of environments, you need to basically get in and get out as fast as you can, on the order of a couple hours at most. And so you really need to prepare for these. And so, uh, <clears throat> we need to minimize the installation time and also the maintenance time. And one of the things we, did to, we needed to do to get that done is to scout out the house, figure out where the floors are, where the walls are, what, if it's wallpaper or masonry, um, where the power outlets are, what the distance from the power outlet to the place we want to deploy is, and so on. So we measure out everything that we could, we assemble all the devices, label them up in advance, design, you know, draw them out where they're going to go, and um, create checklists of all the things that we need, all the extra tools, um, vacuum cleaner and garbage cans so we can get out of there quickly, um, extra sensors in case some of them deploy, breaks so we don't have to leave site, come back again. Um, and you know there are other cases, corner cases, like if you have a crawl space um, where you have to access, make sure you have somebody on site who can fit into it. Um, it's not always not always the case. And so then, what happens when you scale the, the number of days? So as you start scaling, as you start deploying for a longer and longer number of days, then for example, um, our participant, we start to get what we call participant fatigue. So we found that people were able to track their own location by pressing a button. And that gave us ground truth on location, but they could only do that for a couple of hours at most. In fact, after more, about more than 45 minutes, people start to get dizzy from pushing all these buttons. Um, people were able to wear devices to track their locations, but they would only do that for a couple of days before they start taking them off and forgetting to put them back up. And people would self-report on their activities, but they would only do that for a couple of weeks before they started getting fatigued. And people could take surveys by telephone, but they might only do that for a month or a little bit more than a month. Um, and so, and this is true not just for, for volunteers, but also for the researchers themselves. Not because they're not motivated, but because living in a home, it actually requires lots of activity. It requires family activities and cooking activities and so on. And you can only sacrifice those activities for a study to such, such an extent. And so we decided that our, we decided to model our participants much like sensors that you would deploy in an outdoor environment. They all have batteries, and those batteries have a finite amount of energy. And you can either use it very quickly for very intense activities, or you can use it very, for over long periods of time for a small number of activities. We also found that over long, as the number of days grows, aesthetics matter more. And again, this is not just for um, volunteers, even in our researcher homes, there were volunteers, like spouses and children and grandparents and, and guests and so on. And our original systems had a large number of exposed circuit boards and wires all over the place. I mean, people had to sort of work around that. And that just didn't last very long. It just was not a viable long-term deployment. Um, so our later systems were designed to literally disappear into the real world. So these sensors here, now this is actually a wireless uh, light switch, and this sensor here is almost invisible. It looks very much like the door jam itself. Uh, we also need to make sure that our sensor systems are not just invisible and aesthetically pleasing while they're deployed, but also after they're taken down. So things like double-sided tape, peel the paint, and then actually, you know, it would take us longer to fix that paint and cost more money to buy the, the paint than it would to, to take the sensors down themselves. And then we also found that, you know, LEDs are not a good idea, I think. So, uh, you know, the LEDs on your lights, on your, on your uh, television, or on your VCR, you know, those are common annoyance. Uh, we did a calculation that after deploying a couple hundred nodes, we ended up putting in more than 150 LEDs <coughs> into a single house. And those LEDs weren't visible during the day when we made the, did the deployment, but at night we got reports of um, a laser light show and circus, right, when all the lights are turned off. So the, the house basically, you, you can't turn the lights off in the house. Um, and that causes, uh, that's, you know, think of it as a deployment risk. It's a, it's a lifetime, a sense of lifetime risk. And similarly, noise could be a problem. So in one home, we had a UPS system that was backing up, providing backup power for all of our main systems. The power went out at 5.30 in the morning. The UPS started beeping incessantly. And to get it to stop beeping, the homeowners pulled all the plugs out. 
and then power came on a half an hour later. And it took us days to make an appointment, go back in, and reinstall the system. So the system would have actually come up more quickly had we not installed the UPS at all. Uh, but because of the noise, uh, it, it, it ended up costing uh, several days of data loss. So over the, as the number of days increases, we also find that homes become more hazardous environments. Uh, very much like the hazardous environments you get in a, in, a, in a wild where you have animals stealing your batteries, we have children pulling sensors out of the walls, for example. This might look like a well-designed sensor to us, uh, but without that little screw that holds it into the wall, it might look something like a, you know, a spaceship toy to a child and they'll pull those out. We also find that mobile objects like rooms can knock the sensors out. Uh, in one house we had a Roomba, or a robotic vacuum cleaner, or periodically go around the house and knock all of our sensors out. Um, and then we also found that some of the devices that were installed in somewhat of a precarious fashion um, didn't work that well either. So, and we can't rely on people, training people not, you know, how to use these things. Um, because it turns out that most of the devices that were knocked off were actually knocked off by cleaning services or guests, not by the, not by the uh, participants themselves. And so, as we get to a large number of days, these kinds of um, environmental hazards become a real risk for our deployment and our data integrity. So just to summarize the challenges that we're talking about, we found that AC power is not an, neither an abundant nor a reliable power source. We found that wireless connectivity is much worse than expected, that past devices are double-edged swords, so they're both positive and, and negative. Um, houses are remote environments. You do not have instant access to them. User participation is limited, much like the batteries on your, on your typical sensors. Um, aesthetics are important. They're actually a, a long-term uh, deployment risk. And the home environment has a large, large number of unexpected environmental hazards, much like those that you get in outdoor deployments. So uh, these are some of the, seven of the challenges that we found in homes that we didn't expect. We thought deploying homes would be very easy. We found that it's actually very analogous to deploying in the harsh outdoor environments. Um, although, of course, much more comfortable. But all is not lost. Um, there are ways to try and get over these problems. <coughs> um, a system that we designed about two or three years ago called Pilot Tour is designed to help avoid a large number of these problems. Not all of them, but we're getting close. And it was designed to be fast and easy, so you should be able to take this and do not a real uh, long deployment, but a pilot study. So this is something that you can sort of hack together and get it to run quickly. So we want it to be fast and easy. Um, we want to be able to deploy on large scale, large number of homes, as well as large number of sensors. And we want to be able to deploy on these over long durations. It should, be, it should be long lived. So again, we want it to be fast and easy, large scale, and long duration. So we looked at a number of other systems before we did this and wanted to understand what those were. And we found three basic sets of systems that are already out there that we could try to use. And one we call data management systems. This is things like SMAP, you may have heard of this, or other building management systems, building depot. These are basically big databases that provide facilities like easy access and query to your data where they let you share your data with other researchers. Um, but they're all in the cloud. They don't have any systems running down here in the homes. And so they can't actually deal with most of the environmental deployment hazards and risks that we found in homes. There's another system called Home OS, uh, run out of Microsoft Research, that does install stuff in homes. So this device is what they call a Home OS Hub. Um, you attach your devices to that, and it tries to make sure that they're always running and that you can access them. Um, there were only two problems with it. One was that the Home OS Hub is fairly expensive. It has to be a Windows machine. Um, it was hard for us to get a Windows machine that didn't have a screen and a fan, it has to be quiet. And besides that, we deploy sometimes five or six of these in a the house, so at $300 a pop minimum, um, it, was, it was too expensive for us. But the main issue was actually that it, this is a software framework. There are a bunch of predefined data formats and APIs that we need to conform to. And when you're trying to do a pilot study, you want to download drivers off the internet, you want to throw together some code in it, whatever language makes most sense, and porting that to the language and get, making that conform to the data formats and APIs that are already existing might work for a longer stage deployment, but for our pilot studies, it was too much work. Um, often we're trying to figure out even what sensor to use, never mind trying to 
uh, build it into a framework. And then we have operational tools, we find operational tools, um, things like Keep Me Up and other tools that um, make sure that your software doesn't crash, make sure that you're always connected to the wireless network and so on. But these each solve one problem and nothing puts them all together into a big system. And so that's what we tried to do. We built something called Hydrature that um, is supposed to help our, our sensor network deployment person um, in, in, by deploying a, a, a more um, holistic system. So the first piece that we provide is what we call a configuration node. This is a cloud piece. You, you use a configuration node to configure your entire network. And that configuration, once it's uploaded to the configuration node, automatically gets deployed to all of your access points, all of your endpoints that are actually in the homes. Those endpoints start running the software that you want, collecting the data that you want, and automatically syncing that with another server in the cloud, basically a database or a storage device. Um, and that storage device can, up, can share that data with anything you want, with some of the data, data management systems that we were looking at earlier to help you query it or share it and so on. Um, but it also provides that data to what we call the monitoring node, that checks that data to make sure that um, everything's working as it should. And if it's not, it will alert our user who then needs to do something to fix the problem. And unfortunately in homes, most homes are behind uh, what we call a net, so it's very hard to access those devices. Um, and so we provide one more piece, which is what we call a bridge node. Our deployment person can um, access the bridge node, and there's a reverse tunnel to every single endpoint out there in the world, no matter which home it's in. And so they can easily log in, and as long as they have a network connection, fix whatever problem, whatever software problems arise, and so as long as there's not a hardware problem or a network failure, uh, we, we can have manually fix those issues. And the interface to provide to, to all this infrastructure is uh, extremely simple and it's very similar to an OS, very similar to an, uh, a, a platform. So you get a file interface and you get an ex executable interface, just like you would in, in an OS. The file interface um, on a configuration node, which is that thing on the left, looks kind of like this. You have uh, three directories. You put all your drivers, which are programs you want to run, you put them all into your drivers directory. You have a config directory where you put your files that configure the nodes, and you have what we call checks, which are the pieces of software that run to check if anything's breaking in the checks directory. And in the config directory, for example, or the checks directory, you can actually have subdirectories for things like our, our node called gamma, and then that basically holds all the configuration data for that particular node. Once you upload your configuration to this, configuration server that automatically updates all of the endpoints. And those endpoints have a very simple um, interface as well. It's very similar. You have the driver's directory, which gets synced with the driver's directory on that on configuration node. And any software that you put into this driver's directory is automatically, is guaranteed to, be, to, to run. And if it crashes or it halts, um, the system will automatically restart. And any data that goes into your data directory or logs directory automatically gets synced to the, to the sync node. And anything that runs in the driver's directory and outputs data to standard out automatically gets logged to your data directory. Anything in standard error gets logged to your logs directory. So we have three things that we call magic directories. Anything in here gets run. Anything in those other two gets saved to the cloud. In any format, it's not a database. It's just raw text and text or whatever you have to be saving the data. And that's for ease of use. <clears throat> and then when you go to your sync node, you have a very simple interface too. You can see the node gamma, you can see that all the data and all the logs that it's ever, ever created. Now things go wrong. It doesn't always work this way. So how do we deal with things that go wrong? We have three, three different ways of doing that. One is that we have a web interface. You can kind of see the top of the web interface there at the top of the screen. And you type in some node if you want to or some set of nodes. We'll type gamma into that search screen, say go, and it gives us a, an interface that tells us the status of the node. In this case, the node happens to be green. It tells us about our Wi-Fi access, what's running on it. Um, and so we can check to see whether these nodes are up and running. And this turned out to be essential during deployment. So we have, um, you know, it, when you're deploying a node, you want to know if it's running and if it's working before you walk off site. And so we can quickly check all the nodes as we deploy them, make sure that they're running, um, check to see that they have Wi-Fi access and how strong that access is before we walk off site. And we also let you configure some email addresses. If anything goes wrong, any checks start to fail, then you might get an email address that says, this node is now red. It used to be green. Things have gone down. Um, here's the status of it. So you get an email if something breaks. So first you check when you deploy it, if it works. Then if it breaks, you get an email. And lastly, um, if you couldn't fix the problem, 
you should, you should still have some logs. And so we have a bunch of systems connecting, uh, logging pretty much all the data we could, including you know, RAM utilization, CPU utilization, network connectivity, not just to the access point, but also um, we do, do a trace wrap to the database server, we do uh, you know, pinging to other nodes to see how, what kind of connectivity you have and what's breaking. So then post facto, for those nodes that you couldn't fix, if you can at least download their data manually at some point, then you can figure out why things started to fail and fix that later. So there are three different ways of trying to make sure that we ensure robustness. All, all this stuff is automatically logged to the logs directory, so once you finally do connect it to the internet, you'll have all that access to all of these logs. So just to summarize, we designed this system to be fast and easy, and the way, you know, fast and easy to use, and the way we do that is, number one, we store data in a raw format. We don't require any predefined format, um, and that's for ease of use, but also for longevity. Uh, we're worried that, you know, even for our own systems, if we store it in some proprietary database somewhere, that that software might become old, and we have, you know, we have uh, uh, code decay and data decay, so we want to store the data in its raw format. We also make sure that all our drivers and checks are just executables, so a very simple interface, the same way you would download executables, uh, you can then run them. And uh, we provide only, we only require simple and standard dependencies on tools. In fact, only three. We use SSHD, or SSH cron, and HTTP. So we don't have any specialized tools running. And that, again, that's because um, if we happen to want to use uh, Oracle Database today, when that student graduates and some other student takes over the project and they don't know how to run it or they uh, end up having some sort of file corruption or something, then we can lose a lot of data and a, and a, lot of, a, a, a huge investment in our sensors. Um, so we only use standard tools. And everything that is um, configured, all of our configuration files and software executables um, are only uploaded to our endpoints through version control. So you can't actually directly um, access those nodes. You have to go through some sort of version control like GitHub. And the reason for that is that we can easily trace the source of problems and then roll things back if we need to. Um, and then we also, like I said, support three ways of doing um, reliability. We provide you the ability to check whether it's working, we give you alerts if it breaks, and then we give you the ability to do an analysis post facto if, you, if it couldn't be fixed at the time. So this is the pilot hero system, and let me just go over a little uh, study that we did to see how well this system works and how, to what extent it, it fixes a lot of the problems we found in homes. Um, and so we tested it with a system we call Thermocoach that's appearing next month in Bilson. Um, this system is what we call a thermostat coach. It gives people recommendations about the thermostat um, settings. So down here at the bottom, you can see in this green box that we have occupancy data for this home. We collected that from some sensors. You see this family goes to bed around 1 o'clock. They wake up around 5. They leave the house around 8 o'clock. They sometimes come home after lunch, and they're usually home around 5. And based on this, we give them some recommended schedule of what temperatures they should have at different times of the day that correspond to the times that they wake up, leave the house, come home, and go to sleep. And you'll see next month that the results of this show that it saves about 5% more energy than your standard thermostat, about 12% more energy than your next thermostat. Um, but the key here is how we actually tested this. So we deployed this system along with a standard manual programming interface and the Nest interface in uh, 39 different homes. There were 13 homes in each group, and each group had a different system. Either they had a manually programmable thermostat, an S thermostat, automatic learning thermostat, or our thermocoach system. And in each one of these homes, we deployed five pieces of hardware. We deployed in total about 200, you can barely see that, but that's a motion sensor, about 200 motion sensors, about 40 Nest thermostats, 40 wireless access points, 117 Bluetooth beacons on people's keys to know when they walk out the door or when they came back in and 180 endpoints. These are pilot tier endpoints. We deployed a large number of different devices uh, throughout the home, the, the 39 different homes. And our pilot tier system was flexible enough that we could use whatever resources we happened to have available at the time to deploy the pilot tier system. So our endpoints were Raspberry Pis, very cheap, about $25 each. Our sync node was just a, some node we happened to have on our UVA, University of Virginia computing cluster. And we used also a UVA storage that was freely available to us to do our, our, our storage nodes. We used GitHub as our configuration node. 
And we use Amazon Web Services as a monitoring node. And the main reason for that is that we wanted to make sure that the monitoring, monitoring node, if anything, didn't go down. So at least we would get the emails if everything else went down. So it's a very flexible system. We can deploy it on whatever resources we happen to have to leverage the, the resources we had at the time. Our system cost about $85 per endpoint, and it was about 45 minutes per endpoint for installation. That was about 20 minutes to install the OS, right? If you've ever installed noobs on a Raspberry Pi, you know it takes a long time to flash that SD card. So that actually took the most time of everything. It was 12 minutes to install a private tour, and then 13 minutes to assemble a hardware and peripherals and pre-configure them to go into a house. We had a professional installer go out and deploy the house, somebody who was basically an HVAC repair person who didn't know anything about our system or the electronics or anything about how it worked. And he was able to do this in about 15 minutes per house, 15 minutes per installation, um, deployed by a non-expert using nothing but the web interface that we provided. And the web interface, of course, provided Wi-Fi feedback so the person could know whether they installed these endpoints in the right spot in the home. So over the course of about four months worth that these nodes were deployed, we logged about over 100,000 faults, meaning over 100,000 things failed. Uh, and all nodes, every single one of those endpoints, um, had at least five potentially fatally fault, fatal, fatal faults that would have otherwise taken the system down. But we only required 26 maintenance visits. Many of those were to the same houses, and often that was because they were losing Wi-Fi access. And if you look at this graph here, you can see um, how the, you know, how the robustness of, the, of each home is. So these are, these, are, these are different homes on the y-axis, and this is the number of days. And uh, you know, dark values are good that we're getting a lot of data. The lighter means we're losing more data. And you can see where the actual deployments were. We did them in, in uh, six different days. Those are shown by, by red lines there. And so you can see that on the days when we did the um, actual maintenance visits, some of those homes came back up, which was great. Those homes wouldn't have come back otherwise. But you also see that in many cases where we didn't do a maintenance visit, a home also came back up. So despite the fact that we had potentially fatal failures on almost every single on every single one of our nodes, we still had operational systems in most of the cases, and those systems were self-repairing. So that's pretty much what I have to say about Pilot Tour. We, we think we solved a lot of those problems, but there's more to do. Um, one, of those, one of the big challenges that we're facing today still is to get ground truth in homes. It's very difficult, like I said, to instrument people, and so we don't have any way of getting ground truth over long time periods. Um, and so one of the kinds of ground truth we want to get, for example, is just occupancy. And one system we've designed to do that is to put an RFID tag on people, and then we, deploy, we created something we call an RF doormat. It's basically a bunch of RFID sensors underneath the floorboards, you step through the doorway, it's kind of like stepping on a doormat, and it detects who you are and where you're going. It should get ground truth on your location. Um, again, we, found, we ran into the problem with wearables. Uh, people would take these off when they leave the house. People would take them off when they go to sleep. They were supposed to put them in metal cans in order to prevent them from transmitting too much. Um, but they wouldn't always do that. And sometimes we would get a large amount of noise from these RFID tags that are just sitting around the house. And so it was not a perfect solution. Um, although it did work fairly well when people, um, when people actually used them. Um, and recently we've been trying to use cameras. I, I know I said people don't like being monitored by cameras, and I think that's true. I still think that's true. So we're trying to solve that with some technical solutions. In particular, we, we capture only a very slim, a thin line of video inside the door frame. So the camera can't see outside the door frame. The only video that's recorded is inside the door frame itself. And so you get a very uh, skinny picture of a person as they walk through. Now, that might still be a privacy violation. It's enough to see who the person is. That's actually a key to the system, so we can manually ground shoot this. Um, but if people know where the camera's recording and where it's not, you don't always feel like you're being reported by a camera. It only, you know that you shouldn't do anything illegal or otherwise uh, problematic in your doorways because you might be on camera. But if you're anywhere else in the room, it's fine. Right? You're not going to be recorded. So it gives you a very clear distinction between what's being recorded and what's not. We're calling this system the door fly system. It's still under preparation for publication. Um, but we've gotten some pretty good results so far. And we also found, we also still have a problem with uh, root, what we call root cause identification. So like I said, the Pilotero system gives us an email if something fails. 
which is fine if one sensor fails. We get an email. But if an access point fails, then you end up with failures on an entire subsystem. All the nodes in that subsystem start to fail, and you get a barrage of emails. Um, if your access point in the whole house start, goes down, then you get, um, you, get, you get failures on all the nodes that are going through that access point. And if your relay machine goes down, you're not, you're not actually saving any data, then you'll have to lose data on another subset of, of, of sensors. And so we'll get too many emails when, if anything besides a single node fails. Um, and it's so overwhelming that basically they go into your, your visual standpoint that people stop looking at them at all. And so we don't end up having to fix those problems. And so we need to do what we call fault analysis, where if the sensors are on the y-axis here and timers on the right. We can see that we're getting data from some of these nodes, but not from all of them. And we can identify the periods where they have data loss and start to look for trends, like when lots of nodes lose data at the same time. And if we analyze this data, then we can see things like, well, right around this time here, um, we ended up with uh, having a power outage. We must have, because all the, the nodes that were plugged directly into the walls lost the data. Um, we have done this approach for many of our systems, but it's a very manual intensive process, and we still need to understand the basics of how the system is deployed. And so we'd like to, we're still looking at ways to get, turn this into a, into a general solution. I think there's some interesting problems and papers that can come out of this. So, just to conclude, and start summarizing the beginning of, of the talk, we found that homes are challenging environments for deployment of sensors, and analogous in many ways to the way to the to deploying in outdoor environments. Uh, we provide at least one solution that we call Pilot Tour, which is not a platform, which is a which is a platform for pilot study. It's not a it's not a software framework. You don't need to build your software to it. You can just execute whatever you happen to be doing on this platform. And hopefully it makes sure that it runs and it tells you if it fails and provides you with mechanisms to repair those failures. Uh, if you want to, you're welcome to go look at the code. It's all open source. It's on the web. Um, I already know many groups that are using this and are having some success with it. So uh, feel, please feel free to look at Pilot Tour on GitHub. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Do you, do you have to provide any incentives uh, for people to accept this in their homes? <coughs> Were they aware of what type of information can be extracted from the point there? Um, did we have incentives? Yes, sometimes we did. So, for example, on the, in the, in the uh, thermal coach study, uh, every home had a Nest thermostat installed and also had a large number of other sensors installed. And the I guess the reward, the incentive for participating in that study was that they got to keep the Nest thermostat. It's a nice piece of hardware. I like the hardware. It's two hundred fifty dollars, so it's worth something. Um, it was actually easier for us to leave it in than it would have been to replace it anyway, and so it was a perfect kind of uh, incentive. We also uh, did go through IRB um, Institutional Review Board um, approval for essentially all of these studies. And so, yes, we tried to make sure that people knew what they were getting into before they, they participated. Okay. Um, you mentioned, you know, like the, the sense on the door frame, um, that, that one of the purposes is to identify uh, who's walking past, and who's leaving the light on, who left the fridge open. Why does that actually matter? Like, isn't it more important to then react and switch off the light and automatically close the door? Like, why do you need to identify who is doing what? This is a good question. I think, okay, so there's two pieces to that. One is, why do we want to identify people? There are a number of reasons for that. If you're trying to do something like elderly monitoring uh, in the home, 70% of the elderly live with somebody else. So you can't just instrument the home and understand that somebody's cooking or somebody's bathing or somebody's doing these activities that we care about. You want to know who's doing that uh, because we don't want to. Uh, we want to know, let's say, if somebody skipped a meal, but if the other person in the house ate the meal, then we don't know if they skipped it unless we know who's been eating the meal. Uh, so that's one reason why we want to know identity. Um, the other question was about, can we just do automation? Can we just use home automation to solve these problems? And instead of um, trying to gather information about the fact that who left the lights on, we want to just turn the lights off. Um, the way people respond to automation is actually very complex. And this is actually the reason why our thermal coach system saves more energy than the Nest um, learning 
algorithms. Because when you give feedback to people, if, the, if they have a, an autonomous agency in their home taking care of that problem, they don't really care about the feedback, right? They, when you take control from the user, you also take the responsibility. Um, what we did is you know, help people decide what to do, but we gave them the control to do it. And so when they get feedback saying your energy bill is really high this month, they're actually much more likely to take the actions. So that's why we end up saving more energy. So automation is not necessarily always a good solution. Um, because people are very complex things that we have a hard time understanding. And that's part of the study that we're trying to do. And we think the same thing is true for lighting. Um, we can save, we, we found that some of the households that we were monitoring wasted about 50% of their light, lighting energy. They would never know that. And that's what we call invisible waste. Because when the lights are being wasted, they're not in the room by definition. And so they wouldn't know, but by giving them feedback about who's leaving the lights on, and then specifically which fixtures are they're leaving lights on, um, give this what we call actionable feedback to help them um, change those behaviors. Yeah, question? Um, so, for example, interoperability is one of the big challenges. Have you considered using public work by uh, MTCT, code, um, live machine to machine communication? So, with these protocols that are at the moment just quite old, a bit older, but then I discussed in the context of IoT being an enabler of interoperability. Um, I missed the very first sentence. You said connectivity is one of the main problems? No, interoperability. So if, if, you, if you develop something, if you're a company that develops something, the question is how can this, this customer's protocols work together? You have a bit more, let's say, and, and how can you? Yeah. You have you know, some software, some other technology as well, and you want to do implementation. You need to have something, yeah. Well, to, to clarify, I actually, um, when I said that having multiple COX platforms in the home is a problem, it's not because of interoperability, actually. It's because we're buying one product from this system, they've got their own software stack, hardware bridge, and so on. Another company has a different hardware, software stack, hardware bridge, wireless protocols, and so on. And it's not that they don't interact with each other. We can do that in the cloud, and that's okay. It's that each one of those pieces of hardware, each one of those software stacks, each one of those connectivity models has its own independent set of risks and failures. And so they're all failing independently. And so we end up needing to build, you know, for 12 different products, 12 different systems to keep them all going. And it's actually much easier for us to have one system, one flow of data, one set of software, one set of hardware bridges, so that we can just manage those instead of not managing 12 of them. In fact, we found that the manageability of a system in a house um, got worse more with the number of different kinds of products that we had rather than the number of sensors. So I'd rather have, I'd rather have 100 sensors from one product group than 10 sensors from 10 different product groups. No the question. Okay. Unfortunately, we are running slightly behind schedule, so maybe let's uh, stop uh, the talk now and come in is around uh, the rest of the day, so we can always try to put them off now. Uh, I would like to sort of uh, ask Andreas, Kaba, and Matthias to join me to give us, uh, to open up appreciation. Well, it needs four uh, chairs to hand the certificate <laughs> of appreciation because it's a uh, really good. Yeah.